So, as an immigrant living in Japan, I've often seen some people state some things about Japan, usually in some kind of politically motivated context that I tend to find questionable or that I don't really find to be true. Of course, my stance as an immigrant in the country gives me a unique perspective of the country, different from most outside the country as well as people born here, but this does not necessarily mean that others in the same position as me agree, maybe because they just don't care enough to concern themselves with these things or they were led down some other path of reasoning for whatever reason. Still, I think my experience alone can at least say something about the country, though that isn't necessarily why I feel you should listen to what I say, rather that my anecdotal experience is the reason I decided to ask myself these questions in the first place, since they are important to me. So I don't like misinformation being spread, especially not misinformation that leads to to reinforcing some kind of political narrative, so my objective here is to dispel things that may not be evident to the average person in the English-speaking world by just talking about simple factual things, rather than just anyone's opinions or personal experience. Still, I cannot make you believe certain things, I can only provide certain reasons why I believe you should think them, you're free to see them whatever way you want to. So, with Japan, there are a few things that are a bit odd about it in comparison to other developed countries. For example, how the streets and buildings seem oddly clean, how the crime rate is significantly lower than almost every other country on Earth, as well as how people seem to be quite a bit less fat. Perhaps the most noticeable difference between Japan and Europe, North America, and so on is that it is a larger percentage of one ethnicity than the other regions. Japan sits at 97.8% Japanese, America is 76.5% white, though this still accounts for Latino or Hispanic whites, so the largest percentage of one demographic in America is 60.7% if you only count non-Hispanic and non-Latino whites. Canada is 74.3% European, Germany is 76% German, the UK is 87.1% white, and so on. So it seems like Japan is one of the most ethnically homogenous countries in the world, next to South Korea, North Korea, Portugal, and Tunisia. So it might make sense to think that since Japan has not ridden along recent immigration trends as much as Europe and North America, that this may be the reason that certain elements are better there. Not only is nearly 98% of Japan Japanese, but the refugee approval rate and overall immigration intake there is considerably less than other developed countries. Countries. For example, in 2015, Japan approved 27 out of 7,500 refugee applicants. In the same year, the EU approved 333,350 out of 1,255,640. So this is 0.03% approval for Japan compared to 26.5% for the European Union. In terms of overall immigration numbers yearly, Japan also sits at significantly lower than its developed counterparts. In 2016, Japan took in 90 5,000 immigrants, Germany took in 1,051,000, America took in 1.18 million, the UK took in 0.35 million, and Canada took in 0.3 million. Comparing all these numbers to the overall population at the time, not only is Japan's ratio far lower than the other indicated countries, but it is five times smaller than the ratio for America, which is the next smallest ratio out of the countries in this comparison. So when you look at the context surrounding the attitude toward these things in Japan, it appears to make a lot of sense in correlation with their immigration and refugee stances. For example, in 2005 at the Kyushu National Museum during a ceremony, Japan's Internal Affairs and Communications Minister, Taro Aso, proclaimed that Japan is a one-race nation and that Japan is one nation, one civilization, one language, one culture, and one race. There is no other nation that has such characteristics. It seems to be that this would make sense that he would say this considering the other policies the country has on immigration and refugees. On the other hand, there is an unusual occurrence that happens in Japan, the no foreigners signs. These are signs, usually on the front of restaurants of some kind, that explain that non-Japanese people cannot enter. While this would probably be significantly discouraged through hate speech laws and such in the West, this practice does not receive such a pushback in Japan. There is a hate speech law in Japan, though it seems more like a decoration and not an actual practice. It discourages such a thing, but enacts no penalty for discrimination in this way. At the most, those who feel they are discriminated against can call a national hotline, and it's reasonable to say that this probably won't have much of an effect.
This traditional behavior seems to be exhibited in other parts of Japanese society. For example, Japan follows a tradition with its religion, Shintoism and Buddhism, where they make sure to upkeep their old shrines and temples so that they still appear new. This greatly contrasts Chinese temples, which are now greatly in disrepair after the Cultural Revolution as well as the lack of care given towards them afterward. These shrines have been around since about the 7th century current era, and Buddhist temples emerged around the same time. So this goes to show that after all this time that Japan really cares about maintaining their old buildings as opposed to places in North America and Europe that tend to let old buildings crumble from misuse. Extra care is taken inside of larger religious buildings, such as by not wearing shoes, sitting on bags when you actually do sit, as well as everyone being required to clean the building before leaving. With these practices, it's easy to imagine why these buildings may have managed to stick around for so long while their counterparts in the western world often are all messy and falling apart. People simply walking around and touching the floor of a building over many years will slowly wear things away. Even within their media, Japan is very isolationist. Throughout the 90s and the 2000s, and even to some extent today, Japan didn't release many of its games worldwide, and thus many older console titles, such as ones on the PS2, Famicom, and such, cannot possibly be played unless you have a Japanese console as well as the original disc slash cartridge. Even now, many developers will not release their game worldwide until many months after its Japanese release. For example, Persona 5 was released in Japan on September 15, 2016, but was not released worldwide until nearly seven months later, on April 4th, 2017. However, it could be said that this happens because of reluctance to take economic risk for localizing something and releasing it worldwide, rather than it being because of some sort of nationalism in the developers making them not want to appeal to outside audiences. In a lot of cases, people throw around the term ethnostate in relation to Japan, but in many of these examples I found that nobody really finds any more explanation to use this word other than simply, there's a lot of one ethnicity there. So, what exactly is an ethnostate then, and what are examples of this? Of course, Japan has 97% Japanese population, but does this mean it's an ethnostate? According to the Oxford Dictionary, an ethnostate is a sovereign state of which citizenship is restricted to members of a particular racial or ethnic group. So in this case, this means that the government makes laws or regulations specifically restricting things on a basis of ethnicity. So let's see what Japan has in terms of citizenship laws. Japanese law states that someone not born with citizenship must fulfill the following requirements to become a citizen. First, a continuous residence in Japan for five years. Second, that the person must be at least 20 years old and otherwise legally competent. Third, a history of good behavior generally and no past history of seditious behavior. Four, sufficient capital or skills either personally or within family to support oneself in Japan. Five, stateless or willing to renounce foreign citizenship and swear allegiance to Japan. Keep in mind that anyone who is of age and a citizen of Japan can run for office, so it is definitely allowed for non-ethnically Japanese people to run for office. Of course, this would probably be difficult to gain support as a non-Japanese politician, but there is nothing in Japanese law stopping people from running on a basis of ethnicity. Anyway, it looks like none of these actually have anything to do with ethnicity or blood, but let's look at the requirements for someone to be considered a Japanese citizen at birth. 1. When either parent is a Japanese national at the time of birth, if born abroad and the child has a foreign nationality at birth, the child must be registered within three months of a birth or otherwise will have to live in Japan before the age of 20 and notify the Ministry of Justice. 2. When either parent dies before the birth and is a Japanese national at the time of death, limited to fathers until 1985. 3. When the person is born on Japanese soil and both parents are unknown or stateless. So in Japan's case, a child is given citizenship simply if at least one of their parents is a Japanese national. This doesn't mean Japanese ethnicity, however. Since anyone can become a Japanese national, it is possible for a Nigerian to move to Japan, have a child with, let's say, a Chinese immigrant to Japan after the Nigerian attained a citizenship, then the child would be considered a Japanese citizen. For the most part, there does not seem to be any complications to this or other intervening laws stopping someone from becoming a citizen for other reasons. In 1985, there was a law created that prevented a child from gaining citizenship if, at the time of birth, the father had not acknowledged paternity and the parents were not married before the child's birth. This law was determined to be unconstitutional in 2008. Other than this, there does not seem to be any other complications surrounding birth citizenship.
So, it seems as if legally Japan does not fit the definition of ethnostate, but let's check again to make sure if there are any other tenets that can make the state ethno-nationalist in nature, as a simple definition may not be enough sometimes. Other sources cite an ethnostate as being a belief that a nation and a state are the same thing, as in, you belong to a particular place as a result of your genetic ties. You could maybe make the argument that it can have ethno-nationalist tendencies if people are less accepted socially because of their ethnicity, but by what metric would we say that this is any different in Japan in comparison to basically every other country in the world where minorities generally incur at least some lack of social acceptance from the majority. While you could say that perhaps minorities do face worse problems in Japan compared to other developed countries, I wouldn't claim that this happens to an extreme degree to the point that it by far exceeds how it is in America or Europe. And in some cases, I would say that those places are actually less welcoming to minorities. Either way, this does not come from a governmental desire to attain racial or ethnic purity by law, just as basically every other developed country, so I don't see how it is much different here in comparison. Still, we may want to examine if there are significant barriers to attaining citizenship, since even if the law does not state ethnic requirement, it doesn't necessarily mean that the government will always follow this. Looking at the citizenship approval ratings released publicly by the Ministry of Justice, it appears as if outside the law discrimination is relatively low considering the rejection rate of those who apply for a citizenship in Japan has not reached higher than 7% within the last 30 years. And for most years it sits around 1-3%. to Notice that around 90% of applicants are either Korean or Chinese. These groups appear to usually be approved despite the bad tension that these ethnic groups tend to have with Japan. It can't be said if there is significant discrimination against those of African or Arabic descent or not, or any other ethnicity really, as all non-Chinese and non-Korean applicants are grouped into others for the chart released by the Ministry of Japan. One thing to note is that the rejection rate has rose significantly in recent years, with it being the highest in 2018. While this may be a problem due to increased nationalism in Japan in recent years, more than 90% of applicants are still approved despite this. So not only does Japan have no laws restricting citizenship to people of specific backgrounds, but also the supposed discrimination in the citizenship application process is likely low considering the acceptance rate. But there still may be other complications that make a state ethno-nationalist. As Jerry Muller describes, it can relate to cultural values as well. To an extent, we might say that Japan is an ethno-state if it does exhibit one culture or ethnicity predominantly, even if it does not enforce any benefit for these things by law. So first, we may question assuming it is mono-ethnic or monocultural, if this really means anything necessarily positive for the country at all, and to get to this we first need to examine the background behind common statements relating to this as well as what reasoning they use. Remember what I said earlier about the quote by Taro Aso claiming that Japan is one people? Well, it turns out that history as well as a few academics aren't exactly in agreement with that statement. John Lai of the University of California claims that appeals such as these are merely political in their intent, that they are just trying to rally support for the people behind a specific group or idea, and aren't necessarily stating anything based in the realities of what Japan is as a country. This would make sense as most people in Japan could more easily relate to this sentiment of it being one people, as most of them are not the victims of racial prejudice in Japan's history, making them more likely to see this kind of statement as showing their existence in a positive manner. Japanese academics such as Harumi Beifu and Kosaku Yoshino also agree with this description of this rhetoric known as the focus of Nihon Jinron, meaning promotion of Japanese society or culture as being unique. Yoshino says of this that Nihon Jinron was used to reinforce the national identity of Japanese businessmen who transferred Japanese management values in the context of widespread Japanese direct foreign investment since the 1970s. Hence, it was used as an instrument for the expansion and acceptance of Japanese economic dominance worldwide. So, this seems to indicate that there may be some motive for this narrative to be espoused that isn't necessarily related to it being true or its supposed positive values, and it is true that Japan is a massive world power, and was even more powerful in the late 20th century to the point that some believed Japan would take over America as the leading world power, meaning perhaps that this was the actual reason that this was stated by politicians and not because the country actually is an ethnostate or that it gains anything from being one. So. Back to the actual demographic numbers. Why exactly would having a larger number of one demographic make a country better? Yemen is 92% Arabic, yet the country has far larger problems with poverty and crime than Japan, and the country is considered the fourth most corrupt country in the world by the perception of its people. Tunisia is 98% Arab Berber, and while not nearly as contentious of a country as Yemen, the country still has a much lower human development index than Japan, meaning that it has lower life expectancy, a far lower literacy rate, 
rate and generally worse education than Japan, and also it is considered far more corrupt by its people than Japan. Also, North fucking Korea is 99.9% .9 Korean. I haven't really seen anyone saying that North Korea is powerful for its cultural homogeneity, nor do I think that stating this will become a trend anytime soon either. So it seems here that ethnicity and homogeneity are not deciding factors in the positive and negative elements of a country, and that instead it is a complication of many different factors including history, governmental decisions, among other things that are what actually decide the extent of the positive qualities of a country. Of course, there are the actual demographic statistics as well as the culture that tend to be associated with those qualities, which can have some effect on if a country is an ethnostate or not. In accordance with minorities in a population, you might argue that ethnicity or homogeneity has some bearing in certain types of conflicts that occur there. For example, Japanese people have been victims of discrimination in the United States as they were placed in internment camps under the belief that they might be accomplices of the Japanese army that was fighting America at the time. You could say that the Japanese people not being there means that that specific conflict could have been avoided entirely. However, I would argue that there is no such thing as a 100% homogenous society and that all countries in the world have oppressed minority populations to some extent in their past, so avoiding these kinds of conflicts perpetually is basically impossible. Japan is no exception to this, considering the Ainu people, the Ryukyuan people, as well as the Zainichi Koreans. These deal both with the cultural and ethnic aspects of a supposed ethnostate, but let's go more specifically into their history to explain how they influence those factors within Japan. The Ryukyuan people, historically living mostly in the Ryukyu Islands, the most noticeable of which being Okinawa, have their own customs, including their own religion, food, family culture, and even their own language, which is different from the Yamato people, who are the major ethnic group of Japan. During the Meiji period, the Ryukyuan people were forcefully assimilated into Japanese culture. Later, after the end of World War II, U.S. military personnel remained in the area as the area was still a U.S. territory. During this time, the locals experienced significant mistreatment from the military workers, such as accidental killings and countless rapes and murders of the locals by the occupying military. Due to this, there now exists a large anti-U.S. and anti-Japanese government sentiment within the people of this area, some to the point that they believe the Ryukyu Islands should be their own country. It can be argued that Okinawa currently sits as the poorest prefecture in all of Japan due largely to its history of discrimination from the Japanese and US governments. The Ainu also have their own language, culture, etc. However, the language is basically dead at this point. The Ainu were natives of Hokkaido, which is the big northern island of Japan. For most of the past 1000 years, the Ainu and Japanese remained separate and they had a trading partnership starting around the 1600s. During the early 1800s, there was a considerable effort by the Japanese to assimilate the Ainu people, or at least use them for their own gain. This happened in the form of providing food and clothes for those who agreed to speak Japanese while abandoning their own culture, and also many Ainu women were forcibly married to Japanese merchants. These women were often tortured if they fought against being raped in these relationships. Later on, near the start of the 20th century, the Japanese government passed an act to colonize all of Hokkaido. During this time, the Ainu were forced to speak Japanese, adopt Japanese names, as well as abandon their religious practices. The Ainu were not recognized as an indigenous group in Japan until 2008. Even to this day, both the Ryukyuan and Ainu are considered Japanese under the Japanese census as it has no options for ethnicity, only for nationalities essentially. While about 98% of people in Japan are considered Japanese by the government, this only accounts for nationality. So this means anyone naturalized is considered Japanese even if they were born somewhere else. Therefore, the only people who are outside this statistic are immigrants who are not citizens. I'd guess that if mixed race residents, Japanese minorities, as well as naturalized immigrants were all given separate categories, that ethnically Japanese or Yamato people would actually be about 93-95%. to The third, and possibly most noteworthy, case of minority oppression is of ethnic Koreans who stayed in Japan after the end of World War II, who were originally in Japan as a result of issues in Korea causing them to look for work and life elsewhere. They are called Zainichi Korean, which Zainichi on its own essentially denotes them as foreign and not Japanese. Japanese, even though the majority have lived in Japan their entire lives, are basically Japanese culturally and can speak Japanese natively. Many of these people are not officially Japanese citizens and exist as an exception case called special permanent residents, whose rights differ from Japanese nationals mainly and that they cannot vote. So as a side note here, I would say that the prevention of a specific group that is ethnic in its perception from voting is as clear as you can get in terms of considering a group as systemically oppressed, as it means that their voice cannot be heard in terms of the government, thus
thus they basically don't exist as a party that those vying for power have to care about appealing to in any way. So you may wonder, why don't they just become citizens? Which is a good question because nothing is really stopping them from doing so. However, this usually means adopting a Japanese name and other changes that basically entail abandoning Korean identity and family ties, partially because doing these things is required to avoid discrimination at work and such. The Japanese nationality law basically means that you aren't allowed to vote unless you revoke all other citizenship and consider yourself as part of the in-group. A lot of this is also historically tied to the Japanese-Korean community's historic discrimination at the hands of the Japanese government, such as being forbidden from working as government employees due to also being prevented from being citizens, and also being forced to reveal that they were Korean in matters of the law, which basically is just a case where it allows the government to more easily discriminate against minorities. With this in mind, it's easy to see why many Zainichi Koreans may not trust the Japanese government after everything they've done to them in the past, making them less likely to give in to what is entailed by achieving citizenship. So, the Japanese government still refuses to allow Koreans who have stayed in Japan for multiple generations to vote while simultaneously still be considered Korean. Basically, this is forced assimilation in a manner similar to the Ainu and Ryukyuan, only in a more modern and legal way rather than a violent way. So, after looking at these three examples, it doesn't appear as if Japan is culturally or ethnically homogenous, and that those who differed from the main group in this instance all incurred significant discrimination for their differences, just like other countries with a larger percentage of minority population. So, looking into the one race, one people narrative, you could say that for the Japanese government this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because they wanted it to happen so they essentially forced this to be the case, or at least for this to appear to be so. At many points where a group differed from the main group, they basically used their power, either forcefully or more implicitly, to make them act like the main group. So, of course, everyone is going to seem the same if the only acceptable presentation is to be that way. And this is kind of a strange concept, as this essentially means if I were to become Japanese, I would be no more or less Japanese than any of the people born with that status by all manner of consideration from the government. So, as far as it is seen legally, Japanese is only a status of nationality. It has nothing inherently to do with ethnicity, which makes me wonder why we refer to Yamato people as Japanese anyway, since the presentation is that Japanese is a social status, not an ethnicity. And looking back at the supposed benefits of a monocultural society, this does not seem to be the reality of Japan, as the country still has incurred the same problems that other countries have for its diverse elements to counter the claim that Japan does not have these issues due to it being monocultural. And of course, also there are minorities in Japan and they have, and still experience systemic discrimination in law, at work, and in day-to-day -day life. The only reason it might seem like these things don't exist in Japan is because the government specifically went out of its way to not make note of them at many points in history, to a degree more than most governments in Europe and North America have. You might also say that part of the reason for this assumption is because people generally aren't that informed on the lifestyle and issues of other countries, which is another topic entirely, but this is undeniably something that shapes everyone's perceptions of people and ideas that originate outside of where they live. In actuality, it seems like the people who are making the argument that Japan is supposedly so great due to its monocultural or monoethnic society either simply don't know anything about countries with similar situations that are far worse, or they are just purposely hoping that you ignore those examples because they don't actually care about being logically consistent, but instead are just looking to justify a particular narrative by only paying attention to things that go along with what they already believe, also known as motivated reasoning. And many of these arguments of Japan having a supposed rich culture only make sense if you ignore many of the elements that make up a large part of the culture being the way it is. For one, the manner in which Japanese is written was originally using Chinese characters to transliterate to Japanese sounds, uh, the speaking part of Japanese never was derived from Chinese. Buddhism itself was imported from South India and China, and the parliamentary system used in Japan currently is derived largely from the British system. Aside from that, there is Western culture all over Japan, about 10% of Japanese vocabulary consists of English loanwords, there are American films and TV shows sold all over Japan, and there are also European-style buildings all over the country. The amount of ways in which Japan is currently not Japanese is so numerous that it makes it obvious how absurd it is to insist that the country and culture do not owe a great deal of their existence to the contributions of other cultures, just as every other culture currently in existence does. 
and this has happened at many other points. Uh, China influenced many other Asian countries in the past due to them all using the same script. America has very clearly been influenced by a large number of European cultures due to the things such as food and architecture they brought along, as well as how it is influenced by Central and South American culture in music and food. Indonesia was largely a Hindu culture up until the 13th century, by which time some Arab leaders came there and spread the culture of Islam, while the country to this day still has a take on the culture that is considerably different from most of the Islamic countries in the Middle East. Furthermore, Buddhist culture still dominates a large portion of East and Southeast Asia today, but some 2,000 years ago, it did not exist in most of those countries and was initially spread from what is now called India. So this is the way it is with every culture currently existing as well as past ones. There's nobody who has a truly unique culture. Everyone has elements that they borrow from other places. Every place is just a result of a number of mixing influences that have occurred long over their history. You could say that every place has a unique take on a mix of cultures, but this isn't the most reliable, as the culture will tend to differ depending on the specific location within a country, and that culture might be more similar to somewhere else outside the country than it is to many of the places within, meaning that it isn't something even the whole country agrees on. At the very least, a country just indicates a tendency towards specific things, and even then there are many examples within specific countries that differ greatly from the dominant culture there, such as for regions like Kashmir in India, the Basque region in Spain, and western China. This is why Japanese people People, just like everyone else, do not gain anything from insisting that their culture is uniquely theirs because this is both false and is a perception that can only ultimately tear people apart, as has been demonstrated basically every time this kind of sentiment has existed in any society. Saying that your culture is uniquely yours is denying that other cultures played a part in yours, thus disconnecting you from others that you do have some relation to. And anyway, it's not like distancing yourself from others really helps if you have a chance of a positive relationship. You might as well try to be positive rather than making it negative from the outset, I suppose. So really, I don't see much reason to view Japan as that different from most other developed countries in its current form as well as what it did in the past to get where it is now. It has a history of oppression of minorities and crimes against them that did so in a manner quite similar to how every other society has done so. America had the Native Americans, Australia had its Aboriginals, Canada had the Inuits, and so on. Not to mention that the other non-native minorities of all these countries also received similar treatment. There is no reason to view Japan as special or enlightened just for having a certain heritage or for being born in a certain place. They are just people living in a country with its own strengths and weaknesses, just like every other country. So while Japan is not an ethnostate in the legal sense, we should still not hold its apparent ethnostate-like tendencies in the ethnic or cultural sense in any sort of positive manner, because them having these didn't lead them on a path any different from any other countries with a similar amount of development, but a different amount of ethnic homogeneity. Still, it isn't really an ethnostate in that manner either, since I don't believe that anything can truly be an ethnostate from a cultural or ethnic sense, and therefore we should try to work with people from other cultures as well as we can, since a society in which people from other cultures don't interact is basically impossible. And as a final note here, earlier this year Taro Aso made a statement in which he apologized for basically ignoring the existence of the Ainu and Ryukyuan to state that Japan is a one-race nation. While you could say that this was merely to save face as Japan is now more clearly moving into a higher immigration direction, this goes to show that the Japanese government itself does not agree with the homogenous narrative to some extent, and that instead they just probably care about making use of whatever is politically advantageous to them. This is like the guy people point to for the argument of Japan being an ethnostate, and even he is pulled back on his statement. So then, what is even left to excuse the narrative at this point?